here he is, Emmanuel from uh, from Berlin. Uh, Emmanuel. Hi, Emmanuel. Hi, Emmanuel. How are you? Emmanuel. So <laughs> I, had, I had Emmanuel Cesson the other day. So that's many, many Emmanuel. We, we uh, could that's a lot. Yes. Get, yeah, yes. Yeah. We could get. It's, it always feels funny for me, actually, every time we are talking to each other like this. Yes. And in emails. Yeah. But, you know, that's how they call us. Yes, that's what, how they call us. I, actually, I, I like my name. Uh, uh, a lot of people don't like their names. I like my name. And it, it is funny to say Emmanuel to Emmanuel, but I enjoy it. And actually, the, the, the meaning being God with us, it's a quite a nice thing to say. It's a little heavy to carry, but uh, we're trying uh, <laughs> to. to be. So, Emmanuel is, of course, Emmanuel Paud, the international flute player, who is also the first flute or co-first flute of the Berliner Philharmoniker. Uh, an amazing teacher, uh, having an incredible international career, which is very rare for an instrumentalist like, like a flute player or a bow player, wind players in general. Uh, you are a pianist, you're an international uh, soloist or a, a violinist, but for flutists, there are very few who achieve that world fame. Uh, and among those, uh, Emmanuel is, is one of the most uh, significant one in the history of instruments. And, uh, Except for that, he's also a great ambassador for, for music in general. So Emmanuel is confined in Berlin right now. Uh, and how, how do you leave this, this time, this COVID uh, time? And what's the situation in Germany right now? Well, um, it's um, still a weird time, actually. Uh, of course, we're musically, professionally not able to resume uh, concert activity. Uh, because concert halls are not uh, open to public until the middle of the summer, if not late summer. And even then, we don't know at which conditions yet. Uh, they will allow gatherings for the duration of a concert, how long a concert should be. I think for opera houses, it's going to be even tighter uh, because of the amount of singing uh, people, which seems to be projecting more aerosols than any other uh, way of making music, uh, actually. Uh, wind instruments are not much of a problem, actually. It's even more concentrated than when you're wearing a mask. So it's really quite a good protection against the environment. There again, the flute may be the most uh, problematic instrument, but even that, the studies made in Vienna, in Munich, in Berlin, together with the local orchestras and local uh, hospitals, have shown that the aerosol may be something a maximum of 85, 86 centimeters, which would be like three feet or less. Right. Um, and which is absolutely workable distance. Currently, we're not there yet. That's only recommendations that we're getting. We're dealing with uh, health um, institutes, with politicians, uh, with authorities that have to allow to open the houses in a new way. And this is the tricky uh, part of the thing. So that's the musical part. Personally, I was, uh, I've been on a sabbatical since my 50th birthday at the end of January. Uh, this was my birthday present to myself. This 50th year on the planet should be a year, kind of year off. So focusing on my homework in Berlin, basically, in the orchestra, the first true season with Kirill Petrenko as the chief conductor for the Berlin Philharmonica, and playing just a few solo gigs, uh, not so much around the world, but a few festivals in the summer, three, four projects until the summer break, and then again until Christmas, three, four other projects. Just that like sounds like resident. a practical, Emmanuel. That sounds like a real season, you know? That sounds like a real season. No, for me, it's, uh, for me that's really far less, because the full season will be packed with 150 concerts. Um, so that really is a slowdown rhythm. Uh, but none of this is happening. Everything is cancelled. Um, in Europe, we have a lot more social protection than many other countries. So uh, the, the salaries are being currently paid up to a certain extent, of course, there are cutbacks, there are uh, a lot of things that we were doing freelancing that are not covered by social uh, system. So uh, there are emergency situations, there are some funds that are being raised for people who are in these emergency situations, and it's really a lesson not to live too much on credit, but uh, to maybe put apart something that will allow you to be able to go on for half a year, um, something like that, that would be that, that would be a good idea to think right. this way, not just for people, but also for states, for governments. Right. Um, so there is, there is a big the divide here uh, between the US and Europe, because as you know, the funding for the arts in the US is done through fundraising, 
uh, and sponsoring and mecena, as we say. Uh, and uh, this this has brought a lot of a lot of hardship to many institutions and a lot of uh, uncertainty. Um, for artists in general, what your advice to put money aside is a very good advice, but artists usually are not necessarily doing that. And sometimes they just have to live from check to check. And the, the big danger we think for, for our industry is that some of our colleagues won't be able to support themselves. They will have to take a second job and then they might not be ready when everything opens again. Um, the other question that people are having is why are sports venues allowed to start again when the theaters are not allowed to start again, you know? And as you were saying, you know, after all, if maybe a singer, you know, is spitting in your face all his virus, but a violin is not, and a flute is only to a very, very, very small extent. So there, are, there is already a lot of uh, pressure and even anger uh, toward um, governments to, 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 to allow um, theaters to, to, to reopen. We just, we just don't know, it, because those waves are different from one country to the other. So, which brings me to one question. Why, why, why do you think Germany fared so far so well in the crisis? What's, what's the theory, at least in Berlin, from the, the point of view of the Germans? Um, what is um, for sure is that the medical infrastructure is excellent here. The investment is probably the highest uh, uh, in the world level. They had enough breathing machine, uh, but they didn't have enough personnel to operate them. Right. That was the problem. So yeah. they're saving costs on the number of people operating these machines, the expense on that, but not on the quality of the equipment. So mm -hmm. it's a quite different philosophy than in most of the other countries. Um, I was uh, personally uh, in Africa, in Kenya, for the first time in my life on March the 13th when the, the operations were stopped in Germany in any concert hall and then three days later the borders of Kenya were closed. Commercial flights uh, were cancelled and it took uh, until the 4th of April for uh, me uh, to return uh, to Berlin on a government flight. Um, but I was not in a hurry. It was sunny weather, there was a swimming pool, uh, and the hotel was happy to go on running even with only one uh, family as customers. So it was a kind of paradise in a weird, weird situation, in a world okay. collapsing around, you know. Um, um, fortunately, around in my family, which is spread across its various European countries, France, uh, Switzerland, and Germany, um, we all have our the, the similar kind of instinct. If we go out, we protect with a mask, um, and and we try to walk at least one hour per day, which in France was possible with the, if you fill in a special authorization form for that, um, just to keep the system working, operating. You try to eat as healthy as possible, a glass of wine in a very French tradition, in order to keep the spirit. Also, that's a just very important thing. Well, just one uh, maybe. Um, yeah. In, after this conversation, Berlin time, probably not California time. No, it's a little too early. That might be a bit early for the aperitif. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, why did Germany fare so well? First of all, if you tell Germans there's a danger out there, be careful, they will be careful. Right. They will be. In right. Italy or in France, it's not the same way. They don't. They say, ah, oh, this is not for me. This, the, I'm not the person in danger or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, the mentality and the way we deal with things individually or collectively are very different as well. So this is why uh, German tradition for collective sports, collective arts is always at a top level it result is. collectively. Individually, you would be surprised to see that you can name less artists or sportsmen uh, maybe than in other countries where it's a, the opposed relationship, where you have a lot more stellar appearances, but a lot less... Um, Individual stardom, and, and, and yes, that, that, that is a very uh, interesting point of view. Um, I didn't know you were in a semi-sabbatical, let's say, uh, uh, and, and good for you. I mean, so the timing is kind of wonderful, and I personally have been craving for a sabbatical for so many years, and here it is imposed on me, and I can't really enjoy it for mainly because we are still working a lot. We are 
dealing you know, with my Prague Orchestra or with the Dallas Opera with a lot of administrative issues to try to make sense of all of this. When are we going to restart? How are we going to restart? You have to, everything that was planned and that has been canceled, you want to postpone it, but where do you put it? How do you uh, finance all of this? This is a full-time work and you wake up at night, you know? And then there is this presence on social media, which we need to have to show our relevance. And, and I, thank you, uh, I thank you for, for doing this because this is exactly uh, in that field. Although nothing is like a real concert, we're trying to, to be relevant and, and, to be, and to be present. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is difficult also because we just don't know when we start again. So even, even if I have, you know, three, four hours to just enjoy myself, I don't enjoy myself because I don't know if I can enjoy myself and for how long I, have, I can enjoy myself. That mental um, work and position is, is very hard to find. To go back to Berlin and this question of individuality and teamwork and spirit of uh, group spirit that the German have, um, this is the most mythical orchestra, maybe with Wiener Philharmoniker in, 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 in other ways, uh, but this is the, the holy grail of uh, orchestral position. And you have a lot of soloists in that orchestra who do have very, very strong personality. It's an orchestra of very strong personality. So I would say from that point of view, of course there is the, the so-called, and let's be careful maybe with the, the cliche, but the German discipline, but at the same time, there is an incredible uh, amount of really genius from one stand to the other, which is quite rare in any orchestra that you have one individual that could be absolutely in the front and defend the, the, the masterpieces. How do these personalities balance themselves in the orchestra? I mean, these are all all the first chairs are alpha people who know better than the other one. How do you cope with that? How does that work? <laughs> well, thanks for all these uh, um, descriptions. Uh, the, the, the alpha uh, beasts are there, but they all play different instruments and they all have different roles that are set by the composer. You know, it's not a matter of hierarchy to say this is violin one or you're playing violin two. It's just different voices. Right. And all of these voices together make the orchestral music sound or the chamber music. When I play with Le Bon Francais, with people as Francois Leleu or Paul Meyer on the clarinet or Radovan Vladkovic on the horn, for example, yeah. it's an all-star team. But we're all in the service of our common vision of the music. And it's not the smallest common footprint, mm -hmm. the smallest common denominator that we're looking for. It's to maximize the power of each of us put at the service of what we can do collectively. So it creates a fifth dimension, mm -hmm. uh, truly a musical hologram. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we're there for. And this is why it's so important, because Berlin Phil is probably one of the few places in the world that gives the opportunity to do this this way. That's why I'm there. That's mm -hmm. why I'm excited to make music with uh, conductors like uh, Kirill Petrenko now, before with Simon Rattle, or before with Claudio Abado, because it's been now since 1993 I've been there, so I've seen a lot already. Yeah. And I'm not yet tired. I'm still, I feel like a student. I'm learning so much from all these guys around, from this, our soloists, our guest conductors, um, from the projection in the hall, the contact with the audience. Well, currently, it's a very different thing. But we have resumed concerts. We are the first institu institution to have resumed the TV concert played live in the Philharmonie after the Easter a disaster, a musical disaster worldwide, uh, with a lot of social media spontaneous presence that was so beautiful, but nothing in concert halls that people or families were actually going to yearly on a yearly basis. All of this, this has disappeared. We resumed live concerts on every Saturday through our digital concert hall because we have the equipment and the traditional. We started this more than 10 years ago and we are in the people's home. When we go on tour, they know us already. They've right. been in our concerts. We've right. been in their home. Right. Before. And this way, it's a way for us of learning that if you do something really beautifully, people can be alive with you even though we are not in the same space. Uh, but the quality has to be top, of course, not just musically, interpretation, but technically also. Mm -hmm. The quality of the equipment, I've seen people in the United States, they built their multimedia room 
specifically yes. to make it work magically with our digital concert hall or with what the Mets in New York uh, offers or with yeah. what other uh, sports team offer, for example. Now, I think this time of reflection for us musicians, you know, I practice a lot more than I uh, have been all these other years because, right. as you said, when we are busy in meetings, in concerts, performance, travel, rehearsal, interviews and stuff like that, we don't have so much time to deal one-on-one -on -one with the music. So we need those kind of sabbaticals. And right. for me, it was on the schedule anyway, but I didn't expect it to become... You got lucky that. from that point of view. Yeah. I'm lucky in a way because yeah. I, I was managing my year this way or right. in this direction more or less. Um, so I'm using it this time anyway for a personal, instrumental, musical, cleanup. I'm reading, I'm practicing, I'm cleaning up things that I didn't have time to clean up in the last 30 years, doing the same in my home. Uh, a lot, there's a lot of construction room after room being refurbished during this year. Uh, okay, some parts are not being produced in Italy right now, so we have to wait a little bit more for them, or some companies don't have the workers that they would have had otherwise, etc. All of that is a bit changed. But it's something that was on my diary in some way or another. So I'm, I'm able to deal with it in a very relaxed way. Nevertheless, before our conversation, I, I was in the Philharmonie rehearsing on stage because we're going to play Saturday Live mm -hmm. again. And it's uh, about 20 musicians on stage. Our chief conductor, Kirill Petrenko, we have the technical facility of the digital concert hall. I think every concert hall that has still a little bit of money should invest it in allowing them to be able to produce some content when slowly, gradually, activity is going to be resumed. We won't be able to open all the halls like this, the cinemas, the theaters, the bars, the cafes, the restaurants, any place where the events, conference centers, hotels, all of this is going to be very progressive and at very different speeds in every different country or state in this world. So we can prepare to offer or propose or find business models for our audience, for the people who are entrusting us with their money, with their time, the people who have a subscription with us, you know, at the Dallas Opera or at the Berlin Philharmonica, wherever there is this relationship, to try to invest some of that money into an equipment that will allow, when we gradually resume, to offer things to the people who are not allowed in, in this moment out of this community. And I think we can generate a lot of bonds. Um, right. The technology is there, we just have to learn how to use it. And I think we're, we're, a, we're ready and able to exchange a lot of information of, of what we have gathered in the last 12 years at Berlin. Right. So I, I totally, fully uh, agree with you. Uh, and uh, in Prague, that's what we're doing already. You know, we, we perform in the Rudolfinum, we, we have used this for, for streaming. Um, it's Again, as we were saying, every area, every country is different, so the rules are different. We had to really social distance, they had to wear masks and so on, but this, this is getting a lot of traction. Um, we, in Dallas, we, we were really ahead in the sense that we understood that our presence on social media, online, was extremely important. And so we cannot put together, as you were saying earlier, an orchestra, a chorus, and soloist, but we have a lot of uh, previous material and content that we can propose to our uh, subscribers or to our audience or to the community in general, but we have also created content outside of the music, but around of the music. So like this conversation, uh, but we also created original content. So like feuilleton and that's, and we are connecting to an audience we had never connected with before. And we are going to try to bring them to this other type of music that they don't necessarily know, and then ultimately to the concert hall. Um, music is, you know, very often I think in, in these very tragic times for some people, uh, we, and, and in, in Dallas, like in any other city, you have a very wealthy part of the population, you also have people who are struggling. And, and sometimes I ask myself, well, we're spending so much money, these people, they need something to eat. And the answer to me is, well, we need to feed the souls. We need to feel the spirits. We need to feel the minds. And that gives me a certain sense of responsibility in my mission as an artist. And so we can never think that art is 
something that is a plus or that is on the side. I really believe strongly it's essential. But if we artists forget this, then we're not doing our job either. And at the same time, it needs to be fun, it needs to be entertaining. And to balance all of this is, is, is very difficult. Let's, let's go back to the Berlin feeling itself, because you said something like, it was a choice to be in an orchestra that would allow me to, if I translate somehow, to express myself fully uh, as, as, as a soloist. Which, which orchestra, you were uh, in uh, various orchestras before that, or was it the first full-time position you had? Um, actually, it was my second full-time position. I was for three years uh, in the Basel uh, Radio Orchestra. Oh, before. It's something. When we say, yeah. say full-time position, in Europe, the, the principal positions are doubled, which means I'm sharing, splitting the season with another alter ego uh, who is playing one week on, one week off, or two weeks on, two weeks off, depending on what kind of programs we have. Of course, in an opera house, it operates in a different way because you have repertoire operas, you have new productions, and therefore you have very different schedules. Uh, the way we work here in Berlin is usually a couple of weeks is one of the players, and then the other player will be would be would be on the next weeks. So uh, this is my experience of a job, and this um, the fact that it's not every week allows me for my food spiritually, musically. Right. Artistically, the time that is available for me cannot be full of emptiness. Can it be full of vacuum? Mm -hmm. It has to be filled uh, with music. And the flute doesn't just exist as the orchestral instrument. It existed in the Baroque, inspired many great compositions by Vivaldi, Bach, and a lot of lesser known composers of that time. Bach, Son, C.P. Bach wrote all this music for Frederick the Great, who was himself a flute player. Frederick the Great's teacher was Quantz a great uh, German composer. Then later on in France, we had, while Mozart was visiting Paris, uh, François de Vienne in the books, like The Grove, for example, which is the encyclopedia of music, he's called the French Mozart. Right. He was not only the French Mozart writing delightful music, but he was also the first presenter of popular concerts, not for aristocrats, for people who would buy a ticket and come to the concert. So the concert form that we know today. He was also the founder of the Paris Conservatoire and teacher for flute and bassoon over there. So he was a great pedagogue and virtuoso himself. And this is the beginning of the famous French flute school, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Jean-Pierre Rampal was, of course, worldwide uh, famous. Marcel Moïse came to Marlboro and founded the festival there with uh, Pablo Casals and uh, Serkin. Uh, back in the, in the war years in Europe and then went back to Paris and, and teach them teach there again. Then a person like James Galway came from Ireland, but his teacher and he himself went to study to Paris for a couple of years in the French school system. There's a top standard for instruments like woodwinds, like harp, for example, sure. uh, to master the instrument at a level that was not available in other countries. Now, all these books have been uh, translated uh, in so many languages, I think in 50 different languages, and you can learn by the French system in every country. And we see that the level internationally in the competition has been growing so at such a high level. It's a, it's a great thing uh, for the flute as, a, as an instrument. Right. So, so which uh, leads me to, uh, the technique has improved actually in not only the flute, but probably you have more pianists who can play very difficult pieces and so on and so on and so on. The musicianship has not necessarily uh, evolved at the same pace, I would say. Um, and and uh, what are you, when you are working with a colleague, um, let's say at the Berlin Field, what do you expect from your colleague in terms of communication? What do you expect from a conductor? Are you more uh, concentrated on technical issue, artic, uh, artistic issues? Um, what do you do when there is possibly uh, a disagreement, for instance, with a conductor, like a tempo that you really don't feel is your tempo. How do you, what, he, what is your level of expectation there? And how do you deal with, eventually you say, we are going to a fifth dimension. What, what if you can't reach that fifth dimension with your colleagues? 
Ah, well, we try to reach it uh, every time. Um, and usually, uh, I would say the text, black and white in the music, is just a support for us to recreate from the original text, just like in religious books, to recreate the vision, the hologram mm -hmm. of the vision of the composer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we study music. And mm -hmm. there has to be only one interpretation. There cannot be 100 interpretation when you have 100 musicians. Absolutely. The music. Uh, so it's very, it's very easy. We know the rules. Pierre Boulez, I know, I remember, said this to my teacher, uh, Aurélie Collet, another French Swiss flute player who was also in the Berlin Philharmonic in the post-war mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. uh, back um, in the Furtwängler and Shelley Bidake times of the orchestra. Um, he told him, I love conducting um, these great orchestras because they know the rules. It was not a question of style, but they know the rules. That's saying, if the conductor says we go this way, it's our job to fly this way and to make the audience fly with us later on. And of course, if I don't recognize the gesture, I, I don't understand the gesture, then it, the rehearsal will be there to explain to me what is intended. Then once it's intended, um, it's not a question of whether I have to accept it or not, as long as I bring in an orchestra the artistic leadership is decided by the conductor. Of course, the conductor will balance. What shall I take from what is coming from the orchestra? What shall I impose as a modification? And that's a matter of personality, sensitivity, artistry, uh, chemistry, a lot of things that have nothing to do with knowledge, but with human relations, with leadership, natural leadership also a lot. Now, if with the same conductor, and this happens about 10 times in a season, that I see a conductor, a guest conductor, or a principal conductor with whom I've had the experience as a soloist for the concerto, I will be setting the interpretation. And I expect the conductor, be, the conductor to be at the service of my tempo choice, of transition choice, dynamic choices, uh, et cetera, and, and, and get this out of the orchestra, from the orchestra, in order to support my interpretation. I, didn't even have this conversation with people like Simon Raffel, Claudio Abado, or yes, Daniel Baron yes, yes. for example, because, or Pablo Yerbi, or Yannick Nézis again, because it's automatic. We understand each other. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why we like making music together, right, right, right. you know? And it's just not name dropping. It is true that, uh, to me, making music with personalities like this is an elevation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and even when I practice on my own here, you know, just spending a few hours in company of Bach, Debussy, or uh, Boulez, or Messiaen, um, Mozart, Schubert, all of this, Prokofiev, it's great to have such friends and yes. to be connected to these, these kind of great songs. Yes, absolutely, know? and and this is, I, I, I this, you're very eloquent in, in all of this, and, and I, totally connect with what you say. And uh, we are having the chance in what we do to be very intimate with the thoughts and the souls of these composers. And whenever I, I finish Mozart Requiem or, or the flute, which are the, almost the last pieces he wrote, you know, with Clemenza di Tito, I really feel I'm, I'm, I'm talking to my friend who is dead and who is alive. It's a very strange thing. And it's a chance to, because these people have a bigger heart and a bigger mind than we had, it's a chance to expand this and, and yes. be better people. I mean, it's really, it really is a chance to connect to things that otherwise we would have never connected to. And we are larger, bigger, deeper after uh, connecting with these incredible geniuses. Um, and I, the, what you say about, accompanying versus playing in a group, it's very true. From me, from the point of view of the conductor, um, my role is definitely to somehow have a vision of the piece, but that vision is always informed by the way I understand where the composer is coming from. I always try to tell my, my, my students or my assistants, put yourself in the chair he was when he had that image of a sound and of a narration or whatever his style is of a poetry in his mind and try to understand how the little signs, very important signs you have on the score, are working with that vision and try to recreate the process 
that led him to write all of this, where it was coming from. And that for me, that's, that's what is going to make it work with an orchestra. I, I always feel that even though I might not have the same interpretation as an orchestra is used to, if I'm honest with that interpretation, if I believe in it and if I defend it, whatever wrong gesture I'm going to do, whatever thing I'm saying, I'm going to say which is wrong, if I'm honest with this and connecting with this, and this has somehow connection with the score, the orchestra is going to go with me. And that's always, you know, as, as, as a conductor, as you know, if you work for the first time with an orchestra, they always look at you like, well, who is that? Well, with long arms, how is it going? Where is their hair? And so on and so on. So you are judge and there are, you have points down or up, which are, have nothing to do with your musical integrity. But if you are honest on the podium, you are going to have them do with you together something that maybe they would not have done otherwise. So that level of communication is is... Is, is, is absolute. Yes, you want to say something? No, oh, I, I just so, so agree to, to, to the way you, you are saying this thing, but also the thought that is behind it, because I know of our common experience on stage in right. different countries, different cultures, how you manage to make a contact with the orchestra and to get this musical motivation. I think the only authenticity that we can claim is to be genuinely honest and vulnerable at the same time. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, because otherwise we cannot expect the other musicians to follow our example if we are not exemplary ourselves in the position of a leader, conductor, soloist. And in an opera house, it's even more impressive because it's like moving a, one, of, you know, one of these huge ships out of the harbor. It's moving it's, the ocean. It, it's not moving the ship. It's moving the, <laughs> it's only moving the ocean. It's just like... Wow, it's just magic every time it happens. And I remember as a kid, I was going to the opera with my parents. Non-musical background in the family, but I was just like oh, fascinated from the first note to the last one. Magic flute by Mozart, Wagner, the, the, the four, the ring, you know? And I remember saying at the end to my parents, already finished? Right. Uh, it was just like, right. wow, so what's so they, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so w what you say about vulnerability, I think it's extremely important. And there is a paradox in the position of the, the conductor, which is every instrumentalist in front of you, especially if it's not that level of the Berliner, Berliner Philharmonica, is somehow in a position that might be a position of, this is not exactly where I want to be, or I would like to be a little freer. I have to give up some, oh, I need to breathe now. Oh, I need to feel this now. So in order to accept this position of slightly submission, they need to have a feeling that the guy in front of them is worse of giving them somehow indication. Breathe now, feel this now. They expect that from him. At the same time, an artist has to do with ambivalence, ambiguity, insecurity. It could be black, it could be pink, it could be in the middle. Uh, this emotion is, no, no, not really this. And you have to tap. Why all these composers wrote those pieces most of the time, not only in the romantic time, it was to feel a, 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 something that was missing inside themselves their own gaps, their own insecurities, and the art is here to make the world back together and make sense. Their emotions, as dark as they are, because they are dark, they are presented, and all of a sudden they are projected, and that darkness brings somehow, possibly, some light and some, some enlightenment. So as an artist, if you are a conductor, you need to have that fragility. You need to have that insecurity. You need to feel, oh my God, it's just, is it this, is it that? It's very hard when you're on the podium to be an artist. And my theory is, I'm glad not too many of our colleagues are going to listen to this, but very few conductors are artists because of what the business has done to us and the difficulty of being in, in that podium, how much your ego is going to be bruised through time as, as a conductor, because you get constantly that feedback from the orchestra that, or in your head mostly, that is saying, no, you're not worth it, or it's more difficult than this. And any conductor, good or bad, is going to go through that phase of immense suffering as they learn to conduct uh, through, through time. My solution to this is 
you can't, if you are too weak on the podium, most of Oxtra are going into this for the reason we were explaining earlier. Why would I give these guys the authority to do something I don't necessarily want to do because I have so many ideas and having ideas is part of why I am an artist and why I was engaged here. So in order to have this confidence on the podium, my solution is to say, okay, I'm like you. I have all my tragedy inside or my happiness or my flaws. But when I'm here, I'm playing a role and I'm going to play that role the best I can. I don't believe I'm better than you. I don't believe I have a, a, a God-given authority to lead you because usually that leads to a situation where, okay, we give you that authority for a few hours, but then we do what we do with dictators. We lynch you. And that's how you have this thing, you know? And nowadays, this kind of authority, I mean, you worked with very authoritarian conductors, but most of them, they were also incredible artists. Uh, nowadays, this is not possible. You don't last very long with, if you're just authoritarian like that. So my, my feeling with this is, I have a role to play and I'm going to play it. But you know, it's just a role I'm playing. What matters to me is how I can connect to this score, to this composer, the way you are connected to the other side, to that score. And that's the only way I can place it together. Yeah, uh, it's, you're, you're raising in the same time, um, a lot of, um, you're bringing a lot of answers and a lot of uh, truth, I find, mm -hmm. um, to a lot of questions that probably a lot of people watching uh, are wondering, or a lot of students uh, or people yes. who are music lovers are asking this as, or maybe some musicians, Asking themselves, but um, uh, truly, um, the, the relationship has to be full of trust, mm -hmm. and vulnerability is part of the trust. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, if you can't be, uh, can't, um, cannot stand being naked in front of somebody, then you're not familiar with that person. Right, right. In and a way, true. You yeah. know, um, if um, it doesn't matter whether Haydn had a schnitzel before writing this piece or went to the toilet just after. Um, because a composer is, we have to be informed about what is happening in the piece, but it's usually a projection of their souls yep. outside of the real, reality context where they were. And this we have as artists uh, who are delivering an interpretation to understand. Mm -hmm. In our position, you as a conductor, another one as a singer, in a, in, as a singer, uh, in a, as a soloist, or in the choir, for example, a ballet dancer, for me as a flute player, as a soloist, as a recitalist, or in an orchestra. And we have to serve the common purpose of actually making the most out of this time together. Not just during the rehearsal, not just during right. the concerts, but on this planet, we are all guests. Right, right. We so have not planned coming here. So let's make the most out of it. Yeah, let's make the most out of it. And, and two ideas come, come to mind when you say this. Um, the first one is my first piece with the Metropolitan Orchestra, uh, the Metropolitan Opera and the New York uh, Orchestra was a butterfly. And I was so excited. And I, of course I was terrified because this was that orchestra. <laughs> And, but I decided to go and walk on that podium yeah. with that attitude. You know what? Whatever happens, happens. I love the piece. Let's just see what happens. And I think they felt this. And after 20 minutes of rehearsals, I'd only a three hour rehearsal and then we were going on stage for once and then it was the premiere and that's the system. And after 20 minutes, when usually you work with an orchestra, you have a mental image, at least that's the way I'd work, mental image of what you want to hear. And of course it evolves with what they give you. And, but most of the time, especially in rehearsal, you, you just, you don't get to the perfection of that mental image or to the depths or to the size of that mental image. Here, I was pumping emotions and there are so many emotions in Butterfly. You know, I was, I was just, really, I mean, tore in pieces. And there it was, right away translated by the orchestra. I had never had that experience. All I was feeling was projected. All I was mentally constructing was perfectly in front of me. 
So I just thought, okay, well, I have to go deeper. My musicianship is the weakest link here. I have to go deeper. I have to give more. And they saw that. So all of a sudden, I was going deeper in the piece because they were allowing me to go deeper in the piece. And that created my connection with that orchestra because that was not anymore what you can or what you can't. That was, let's go as deep as we can in that score. And I, 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 that, that's, that's a, a feeling I am always trying to connect to. It's the same feeling I had the first time I was in front of an orchestra. Oh my God, there are things here that I knew existed, but I never experienced them. Let's go deeper and, and stronger into it. The second thing that comes to mind when, when you speak about all of this is um, the, the two or three times I had a chance to work with you, of course, as a conductor, my job is to really understand what the soloist wants and is doing because you have spent time with those pieces. You have studied them. You know them infinitely better than I do. Um, I, it's so easy to accompany you because there is a coherency and a natural organic development of mm -hmm. the, 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 the line. So all of a sudden it becomes something I can recognize that has a meaning, that has a sense. And so I don't feel I'm following you. I feel you are in a path that you know very well and we're just walking together that path. And that, that's for me the best way to work. I have worked with soloists, world famous soloists who work bar by bar or note by note. It's impossible to accompany them. Mm. It is like walking on a path, but in the dark, because you don't know where you are going. So each step, you, have to, you are worried where you go. I cannot, some of my colleagues can work like this. I absolutely cannot work like this. It's very difficult for me. And it goes back to beyond the, 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 the human aspect, the spiritual aspect we were both talking about. It's also a certain conception of music that for me, and this is something musicians don't talk much about, and I guess Shelly Bidace is someone who was very interested in that, of course. It's the connection between what we call horizontality, which mm -hmm. is going from point A to point B. Of course, in the middle, there are many things that can happen and that colors that pass, and all of a sudden you stop to smell a flower or whatever it is. And then what we can call uh, verticality, which is the weight you give to the sound, the, the gravity that can give the gravitas. So if you are too much into horizontality, it goes like this. If you are too much in verticality, then it's step by step, but you don't go anywhere. For me, the tension between the two, the positive tension in between the two, that's where the music expresses itself. And that's where the sound can shine. And that's something you have. I think what is fascinating to me is this, this connection you have between um, telling a story, having an immense long line that rebounds in phrases, but each phrase is in a big line. But at the same time, you explore the moment with the sound. And your expression is at the connection of all of this. How much do you conceptualize those issues? <laughs> well, uh, of course, it's a lot of uh, shared views uh, when we make music together that you're expressing now. And it's great to hear words on what we experience also musically together. Um, I think what I retain from, from this, but also what I try to transmit to some of our students, which we have here um, uh, at the Academy, uh, Karian Academy of the Berlin Philharmonic, for example, because this is the only place where I teach regularly and coach students for two years while they're um, um, fellows here, um, is about the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. We are playing, you know, as a flute player, we're playing one line. There's music for solo flutes. Okay, that's one line music. We can play transcriptions from the cello, from the violin, from the clarinet, from the oboe. It's usually a harmonic, harmonic illusion. Uh, and then, as you say, there are two axes of music, the depth, the vertical axis, and the horizontal axis. I, I would say there's another one is the time dimension also, uh, but it's also in the part, of course, it's yeah. also in the depth, but it has to do with the phenomenon, with the phenomenology, what Celebitak was oh, very keen yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, 
this doesn't mean that you have to wait for things to happen, but they should come in the moment that they are to happen and not in another moment. And this is where what I realized playing with jazz players, for example, like Jackie Terrison and his trio, or when we played the, did some projects with Winston Marsalis, is that we can play the same music, but jazz players and classical play players in the same moment playing the same music will play in different times. We're shifted a little bit. We don't have the same way of being down in the beat of the bounce is not coming exactly in the same moment. Mm -hmm. That's a cultural thing. But it's very interesting when you start feeling this kind of thing, when it happens to you, when the rebound gets so different, uh, depending on the music that you're playing, then with, that's when you really start learning about style. And it should be the same thing when you're switching from Russian opera to Italian opera, to German opera, um, you know, to classical, to Baroque, uh, Italian Baroque, or uh, it's, there's, it's such a rich world right. uh, and a rich heritage. And I try to do, to study the position of my line in new compositions the same way. I've been commissioning over 15 concertos in the last 15 years, and I'm still going on, and now the corona crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, is the opportunity for me to work even closer with composers who are used to deal, to, 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 to take themselves out of the everyday chaos and be creative at their desk. They're used to this kind of situation, except for them it's even maybe easier now, uh, these months. They are worried because everything that should have been performed these months will be shifted to probably the season after the following one. So which means that they will have a less, a lot less uh, new music commissioned it probably in two years yes. from now. They, so the wave is, will be hitting different um, forms of creation and different forms of uh, uh, human beings or in works at very different times, but it's not finished. Uh, mankind will deal with this for a while, uh, as always. But together, we can show the way out. And whether I'm working on Bach or Mozart or Puccini opera, which I love, by the way, mm -hmm. at a certain point, one of my teachers told me, you're playing everything like Puccini. I said, Great. of course I love Puccini. <laughs> well, it's like yes. Felipe was playing everything like Bruckner, but this was beautiful. Yeah. And, and you, know, you know, when I, I get music now by uh, living composers, it's fascinating. I, of course, I need the conversation with them, like, as we are having now, in order to get the key, what is the key of their work, of their home, mm -hmm. of their, the home of their soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I yeah, see mental, the mental work. piece, yeah. In order to understand, okay, how is it built? How is it constructed? What are the elements? And then, usually, by, just by looking at it, if it's a well-structured composition, I can read what are the connections or the contrasts between my line, the different group of instruments, where the music is, just the work you're doing when you have a score in front of you, basically. Mm -hmm. Analysis of the work so that you understand what is important, what should be in the foreground, what do I want to hear? And once you know this, you respect the other ones much more. First, you're not just playing your thing uh, like this. Mm -hmm. like a bull in the arena, basically. Um, but on the contrary, you're able to interact with the others. And that's about playing together and right. about living together. Right, right. So you're speaking a lot about, I mean, all of this is, is also talking about just singing somehow, you know, uh, this, yeah. what talking about time, sound, horizontality and, and, and verticality. You have a knowledge of opera and you have a passion for opera that is uh, quite remarkable. And my my feeling is that we, we I talk often about this, but uh, you cannot say I'm an opera conductor or I'm a symphony conductor. And usually, when you have a conductor that is only who is only an opera conductor, you can hear that in the pit that there is a lack of sense of details. And if a conductor is only a symphony conductor, you know he has a way sometimes of being cerebral and, and only uh, um, theoretical about the piece. I think that connection is very important. But you have never played in the pit, or have you played ever in the pit? Well, we do have opera projects. Uh, ah. It's once a year we have our, for our Easter festival, uh, which used to be uh, founded by Karajan 45 years ago in Salzburg. Oh. Um, which was allowing him to make uh, great visual productions. He was in charge of everything that was happening of course. there. Yeah. Yeah. He was giving a lot of money himself for the whole thing to happen, and uh, his industrial friends were also allowing him to invite singers like Pavarotti right. uh, or Mirella Freni, for example, for his legendary bohème. 
that he did there than a lot of other operas like this. Now it has changed a little bit, of course, but because times have changed uh, simply, and but the location has also changed. important the for you to, to be in the pit? And, 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 and how, how do you balance this uh, uh, operatic repertoire with the symphonic repertoire? Yes, well, it's just a one-time experience in the year for, for us, uh, Berlin Philharmoniker, that we're happening in the pit, and this is why this festival exists, basically. It's a unique opportunity. Um, and actually, Abado was a long-time conductor in the Scala before he came to Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, Karian was a conductor in Vienna also for many years in his life in an opera house. Uh, Petrenko was before this uh, in Munich and before that at the comic opera here in Berlin. Um, so there's a um, lyrical background. Simon Rattle was married twice to singers, uh, for example. So there are different ways of having a connection to the voice, to all of us. Ask any instrumentalist, a piano, why the piano, why the cello, why conducting, why the trumpet, why the flute, why the triangle? Oh, because this is the closest to my voice. You know, it's the ideal of a voice, basically. And if you don't like your own voice, you cannot use it for singing, then usually you use an instrument or a collection of instruments or an organ or an orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to me, it's fascinating, the interaction in this music and the, 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 the dimension of the, the opera, um, the fact that there is a pit, but sometimes uh, the interludes from the orchestra are just like, wow, taking over what is happening, the action that is actually happening on the pit or the beauty. Sometimes it's just the visual aspect that is so striking. Sometimes it's the agitation with the, the number of people coming in and out. And the, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and of course, the beauty of the singing and of the music. Uh, there are so many aspects. It's just such a wonderful uh, dreamland for me. Um, this is this whether, whether I'm in the pit or not. It makes makes me full of happiness and and keeps the, the kid in me alive. You know, uh, and this is um, how to stay young in a way. Right, right. So so th that dimension of of pleasure, of excitement, and being a kid, uh, which is I think fundamental. And and as busy as our careers are, you know, uh, I think. Artists were successful like you. It's because maybe in a rehearsal you can be a little tired, but when you are on stage performing in concert, you are 100 percent in it, and it's like you're doing this for the first time with the same excitement. And, and, and I think the day for me, I will be bored in a concert. I will say, okay, I have to stop, or I have to take a second. Same here. Yeah, and 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 even when it happens to me, it can happen. You know, when you rehearse, 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 and and you say, uh, I kick myself, whoa, 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 whoa. it's a, such a privilege to be here, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. don't do your taxes now, just be into, in, 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 into this. How, let's go to teaching. I love to, 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 to interact with my young colleagues, uh, and when I work with an orchestra like Juilliard, where you teach orchestra playing somehow, I learn so much just by teaching. I mean, I, and I mean this not metaphorically, just being in front of them and with all these incredibly talented human beings, I have to conceptualize things and to explain things, but then they come back with something that is so enriching to me, not only because I had to conceptualize and get a little smarter to try to explain something, but what I am getting back is really giving me mm. new information. Sorry, I'm having uh, here, we're, we're still recording. Uh, and what, what, how much is teaching important to you? And how do you organize your time with teaching? And how do you choose your students? What do you expect from your students? Um, so, so teaching, uh, there is a little bit of a love and hate relationship for me there. Um, not because uh, I, I find spending time with younger talents uh, and seeing what emerges from them, what flourishes there, something really amazing and if i can be helping uh, the talents to express themselves and master their instrument or their performance uh, better i think that's the greatest thing that i can do i'm just too busy with the 75 concerts with the berlin philharmonic and the 85 concerts on my own as a soloist plus the days traveling and preparing for this and the recordings and my own family etc i just don't have time uh, so anything that comes in as a request is an additional burden mm -hmm. in a day that is already filled and is take, mostly taken away from my time to relax, to focus on my activity 
and to do what uh, what I should be doing in order to be a good and healthy musician. Uh, this is why I hate it in a way, but also because I don't do it in the proper way. I stopped the Berlin Philharmonic one year and was teaching in the Geneva Conservatory, uh, the, the postgraduate students um, and those who were going to the graduation actually, so all, all, of, all of those highly motivated kids. And I found it extremely uh, difficult for me to motivate myself. I was young, in those, still at that time, it's 20 years ago. Um, I was 30 years old, I was more or less 10, 12 years older than, than the students I was teaching. Uh, and I was dealing with them with too many things I was dealing with myself because there was not this distance. I think in maybe 10, 15 years, there will be more of this, that distance for me. I won't be uh, able nor willing to perform so much. Right now, I still feel like a, like a, kid, like a kid and I just want to go out there and, and my life is on stage. And I try to share this experience with the, the, those who enter the academy here in the, of, the, of the Berlin Philharmonic and in some summer festivals. I was in uh, Domaine Forget in Quebec, Canada, for example, since for, for the last uh, 30 years. I've been, or 25 years, I've been, I've been going there regularly. Uh, now I uh, was scheduled to, to go there again, but with Corona, all these things are different now. You know, the teaching is uh, automatically socially distant, remote, um, um, but this is where we can use video. I hear from teachers in Austria and in Germany who have resumed their activity physically uh, teaching in the classroom. Uh, one by one, the students, they said they have been improving during uh, isolation because they haven't been socializing so much they haven't been. They have been focusing on their instrumental playing daily, on a daily basis, and they have been actually improving their their own achievements on the instruments. Meaning that when they sit there and take the horn, for example, they know what's going to come out. Whereas before, they were hoping that it might come up the way that they, you know. And hope is not is not just enough. We have to make it work, of course, as a performer. So I think sharing all these views and um, and accompanying those kids growing uh, in the decisive moment of their career is something really great. I just have uh, problems with the structures available with uh, how um, um, to organize the time and find the possibility of doing this. For me currently, uh, the, the best opportunities being summer academies, one in Europe, one year, one in, in North America, another year, Visiting master classes on concert tours, if I don't have too much on that day, uh, if I'm not traveling on that day, for example, or performing on that day, and otherwise here at the Carrion Academy of the Berlin Philharmonic, because they also get the experience of playing together with us in the orchestra um, about two weeks a month. And I think that's a very valuable experience. So this is technically how it works a little bit for myself. Um, you know, the time you spend teaching when you're a performer, like a flute player, you don't spend this time practicing, actively playing your instrument. Right. And if you don't do this, your instrumental level, personally, will, uh, will change, will, uh, will not get any better. Uh, because as you say, we're learning from our students. So in the same time we're uh, learning positive things, we also learn negative things. If we hear right. them repeat too, too often, yeah. we, we yeah. learn mistakes much faster than <laughs> how to correct That's them. True. That is true, yeah, yeah, that is true. Um, you're saying it, the, the, you're saying you feel very healthy and you can play at your full capacity now. I didn't realize that. I mean, for oboe players, it's clear that there is an age where it's better to, you know, move to maybe another position in the orchestra or do something else and retire, which can be very, very difficult because the oboe player, more than even a flute player, I suppose, need that kind of support and, and, and tension horn players, you know, or trumpet players, the, the lips get done. Violinists can play very late at their best level. Flutes, where, where do you, I mean, it's, it's a kind of an unpolite question, but where do you stand into that it's time to retire question? Well, there, there, there is uh, one exception who is Peter Lucas Graf, the Swiss flute player, um, who has been on a tour um, a year ago to celebrate his 90th birthday. Yeah. Um, and he's in the same, from the same generation like my first flute teacher, um, 
François Binet and, and also Aurel Nicolet, who was my predecessor here in Berlin uh, back in the 50s. Um, so these people have learned to play the flute trained by the old school masters, and this has all been taught to play the instrument. I think the foundations that we learned in that school, in the Marcel Moise or Tafanel Gobert, the French flute school, basically the basics that we learned there, if you know how to do them well, and if you breathe properly, if you keep your body, if you keep your body in a way that your lung heart system is operating in a healthy manner, even in later years, there's no reason why the, the, the flute playing should decline too fast as long as you keep a continuous activity. The problem is these on and offs. And this is why it's so important for me. I've always been uh, taking my instrument with me on holiday when I was a kid, but also later on. Uh, and try to play even 15, 20 minutes just to keep it going, to keep the whole thing oiled, working together. So, so when you play the whole thing, it, what, what you think is declining is it's first the support, it's the leaps, it's the lungs, or it's the whole machine? You know, it's a, such an individual question to, 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 to answer. Uh, we all see that we are, sh we are shrinking with age. In the end, the bones are, uh, are, are the problem, actually. Uh, so when the bones are reducing, the muscles are also reducing, the power is lacking and then mm -hmm. the, the volume is lacking so we cannot breathe and use that air properly. Now the flute is very different to any other wind instrument because every wind instrument, whether brass or woodwind, you blow into the instrument with a resistance and is 